Uh, I'm overjoyed at the opportunity to talk about the topic at hand today uh, with a wonderful panel, a, ve a very, uh, I think, versatile and experienced cross-section of players in, in our space. Um, I think we're going to dive right in. Uh, what constitutes the hype? Um, the first point of uh, what constitutes the hype I'm going to bring up is the just one word, mainstream. Are we going mainstream? Is mainstream coming to us? So I'd like for all of you to kind of in turn uh, react to that word uh, and, and also just say a word about where you're coming from and then we'll, we'll dive in. This, uh, I'm Venkat from Avishkar. Uh, from the point of view of where we are coming from, I think uh, we are going towards mainstream in terms of scale, uh, as well as uh, what should I say, the kind of interventions and initiatives that we see happening in our space. Hi, I'm Claudia from KFW, that's a German DFI. Yes, I also think we are going mainstream, but there is still some room to better define what would be mainstream. Hello, I'm Tarun Nista from Norway. I'm a tech entrepreneur investor doing lots of um, impact investing now. Um, and I think there's definitely a um, mainstreaming of impact investing. But um, if you look at it from outside our bubble, it's still a really small part of the, the world. So I think it's a long ways to go still. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sam Parker from the Shell Foundation. So my one sentence reply to that would be that I think the term impact investing is a really, um, it's great to see it getting profile because it's, it has definitely raised the awareness that business can really support social change and environmental change. Are we going mainstream? I think what I'd like to talk about a little bit, if I get a chance, is that we doesn't really exist. Um, we is a combination of about 15 different communities and uh, in order to work out whether we're going mainstream we have to break it down and figure out what impact investing is made up of and parts of that is going mainstream and parts of that is not going mainstream and we need to get to the next level of specificity to figure out uh, the solutions. Yeah, morning, my name is Amit Bhatia, I'm the CEO of Impact Investors Council in India and uh, I would like to believe we have a pretty widespread consensus that if mainstreaming is wealth maximization, we are not there. And it's not, and these two fields are not going to very quickly converge. I, I think in this world, there's increasing need to specialize and highlight the fact that there is room for capital working towards impact. The jargon debate takes a fair amount of time to settle whether we are using the right jargon, time will tell. So if you're at an investor's session and the moderator asks a question which should be answered in numbers and nobody answers in numbers, that tells you something. We haven't gotten to the numbers yet, though. <laughs> We're going so, to. so let me give you a couple of numbers. Um, I would say of the 17 SDGs, if we look at this globally, there's one SDG that's remotely close to mainstream and that's renewable energy, and they announced at the uh, uh, Investors Risk Climate Summit in New York that in the most recent measured year they uh, deployed $330 billion. So if you take impact investing as the other 16 SDGs, because they're investing in every other category, including some in renewable energy, but that's probably in the $330 billion. So even if you include the $18 billion of DFI money, which shouldn't be in the number, that number is 60 billion. So if you divide 60 billion by 16 SDGs and you compare it to 330 billion, you can see how unbelievably unscaled every other category is based on the actual numbers. David, could you say a word of, uh, about yourself and what oh. your perspective is? Um, so we are, we exist because of another hype versus reality problem. And that's the hype around social enterprise. And the reality is that we don't have a single continentally scaled social enterprise in the world. That of course means we don't have a single globally scaled social enterprise in the world. So 
if you think about all of the innovators that have been identified over all of the decades by all of the organizations that identify almost a thousand of them a year, we do not have one that's gone continental. So hype versus reality is why reach scale exists to figure out how to fix that problem. Thank you. Um, I think we can each hold one of our, our, our own mics and make it easier than passing it around. Um, Venkat, I think you had some thoughts about uh, putting all of this in the context of the SDGs. Sure. Uh, in terms of uh, scale, uh, I'd like to say that uh, some of the uh, things that have been mentioned about in terms of saying uh, renewable energy has scale. Another ca category which has scaled, obviously, is microfinance. Uh, responsibility, I guess, uh, what you say, loans out close to $2 billion a year. Um, or maybe sometimes three as well. Uh, microfinance uh, in India also, I guess, should be about um, 10 billion or more. Uh, so in that sense, uh, and that's only one country, and I think there are many places where it has. Uh, the, uh, these are the two what we, I would like to call, categorize as the pull sectors, where the demand is pretty natural, and you have to execute automatically, the demand is there. Whereas if you take the other categories which are involved in actually creating enterprises or creating services for uh, the unserved populations, it's, you have to, it's a push sector. And so it takes time to build. And this category, uh, I believe uh, the category impact investing came out only in 2008. So to, uh, to, to build scale enterprises, it takes time. And yes, we do have organizations like BRAC who are already billion dollar plus, and they operate in about 15 countries, I think. And uh, so you are getting there. You will, uh, and then that's apart from microfinance, that is. So it'll take time, but uh, the direction is uh, that, it's not to say that you have arrived, but the journey is in that direction. What are we talking about here? How big is this? The BNY report you said talks in the trillions. The GIN reports uh, or JPM reports we've seen talk in the billions, um, while you know most of us in our realm barely talk in the we're using millions in terms of dollars uh, allocated. Uh, could you say a word about your perspectives? Because we have a, you know we have Claudia with a DFI perspective. What do you see um, as the realistic scope of impact investing? and the potential that we have? Okay. <clears throat> I think that that's quite a broad discussion. And for me, the SDGs, at least if you look at it from the FI perspective, probably on the 17 goals you have, every kind of investment we do, you could do in one category. And this has not changed that much. And it was a little bit the same with the Millennium Development Goals before, um, that um, people looked very much at scale. <laughs> And I would like to focus a little bit more, I mean, you need scale, definitely, no doubt, and it's important. But in addition to scale, you need quality and you need sustainability. And even in renewable energy, uh, in many, many countries, we are far away from sustainable systems. And in, I think there, there's a slight difference from impact investment or microfinance. It's much on a smaller scale. But given the fact that you have more private sector involved <coughs> and <coughs> they look more at return, you have a better chance at least to have more quality from the beginning. Still, I think we are very far away also in, in impact investment of setting the right standards and, and of going for quality. And I think we will talk a little bit on this later on, how to define it, what is impact, what is not, uh, what's the way forward. But I think we should avoid talking only on numbers uh, because this might be misleading a little bit. Did anyone else have any thoughts? Well, let me at least, since everyone's here in India, at least put the India's context out there. So India's about two and a half billion dollar of impact investing. And the way we define this currently is for-profit investments in for-profit social enterprises. India's impact investors are actively discussing, can we deepen and broaden and widen the definition? And we're thinking about how can we allow all pools of capital, including government and philanthropic capital, especially CSR money in India, to be able to flow in. 
and on the execution side be able to include non-profits. Uh, it would require different kind of instruments. India's predominantly used equity and debt. 80% of this two and a half billion is in equity to only 20% is in debt. But if we start thinking about pay for success, social impact bonds, and find a way to change the currency in which we think about impact from profits to outcomes, we'll be able to pool capital and we'll be able to pool uh, the execution. And if we are able to do that, this two and a half billion dollar becomes 60 billion dollars overnight in India. And by 2050, we could create a trillion dollar market just in India alone. We recently hosted Ron Cohen, who used to run the G8 committee, and he said globally by same time, the world should be $5 trillion of impact investing. So that roughly is the right market share that India has given the population we have and the problems. So that's the scale of what this sector could become. Right. There's, so I, I'd like to actually d d take a deeper dive into this just for a moment because the semantics are, are, have been quite important. There's a lot of tagging and self-tagging. I'm an impact investor, I, I, and I often meet um, entrepreneurs who are making that distinction. They're like, I'm an entrepreneur. Don't tag me as some social entrepreneur because I want all kinds of money later on at some point. I just would like some of you to reflect on that semantic point. Um, Sam? I think that's a really helpful question. Um, Whilst impact investing is a great slogan, it's really unhelpful in terms of these sorts of discussions when you start talking real business, right? In my, my experience, investing is, impact investors are still investors. So in, in, in our world, which is renewable energy access and mobility, we find that investors still behave as investors. And by choosing a sector, for, I, I prefer to see it as supporting businesses which contribute to achieving the SDGs. That, to, that to me is situates you in businesses which are by definition going to be generating impact. So if you're going to be in, this, in the sanitation sector, you're probably in the business of impact. If you're going to be in the health sector, you're in impact. But now then you have to think about what is the investment side of it. And our experience is that early stage investors are very different from mid-stage investors who are very different from late stage investors. And the most sensible way to analyze it and to see how to expand this space is to say, if you're looking at a business that's going to be in startup phase, what kind of capital is required? Right? In our experience, there's a lot of early stage grant capital that really helps businesses to validate their early, early, early um, proposition, work out what uh, is actually going to work, and build some capacity. There's a mid-stage where you have um, perhaps working capital, you have growth debt, you have early stage equity. All those players think and behave differently, and it's a different, uh, it's a different population of people. And then you have people that are looking for de-risked, already quite established businesses, and they're very happy to invest once you've been through that whole stage, and you have capacity, you have track record, and so on. Now, you bring all of those people together in one room, you get a cacophony of nonsense, because you get early stage entrepreneurs suddenly sitting at the same table as a late stage uh, impact investor looking for devious companies, and they've got nothing to say. Likewise, you, and you suddenly realize if you put them all into different rooms according to the types of money that they're managing, you would find a lot of people in the late stage, and you find very, very few people actually prepared to invest in early stage, high risk grant capital to get businesses up and running. So my, to my sense, to my way of thinking, the way to think about getting this to grow faster is to start having the right people talking together. In other words, bring everyone who's interested in early stage in enterprise development together and figure out how can we quadruple or quintuple the amount of early stage funding to, to, to start building these businesses. Then you, then you figure out the mid-stage debt crisis, which is when you get companies to a certain level, there's very little growth debt around and there's very little um, availability of finance. Bring those people together who've got that kind of risk appetite and say, how can we expand this part of the market? So I prefer to see it as a as the journey of an entrepreneur and how you can actually bring together that uh, availability of different finance mechanisms according to that journey and assume that because they're working, because most of my enterprise partners are working in access to energy, you've got impact. I mean, you're working in an impact sector. So if you're successful, you're almost certainly going to be generating positive impact for people. So I would prefer to look at it rather than lumping it all into one group. So if you take your aspirational numbers, which I totally agree with, but then you layer in the current club-based global north to the global south migration of how we're doing this, 
you never get the, to the aspirational numbers. Everyone inside the investment community will talk to you about how we need to leapfrog in telecom, how we need to leapfrog in insurance, how we need to skip the steps that the Global North went through and go to a new set of parameters, a new set of approaches. You'll never hear the investment community talking about leapfrogging themselves. But that's exactly what needs to happen in India. India needs to leapfrog the traditional ways of doing investment. We need a complete new set of models. They need to do exactly what you said. They need to leverage off the scaled NGO nonprofits in India, which don't exist anywhere else in the world. If you do not leverage off of Akshayapatra, off of Agastya, off of Ekavidlaya, off of Jaipur Rugs, if you don't leverage off those guys, you've lost five years of growth. I work most in the <clears throat> Northern Europe perspective um, in Norway and uh, yeah, a little bit the US. And um, we are starting now a um, uh, a conference in Norway called Catapult that we try to combine technology and impact and we want to kind of connect with SANCAP, SOCAP and the other uh, parts of the world to collaborate and share experiences and uh, knowledge because we see that there's a lot happening here that is very different from what's happening up in Norway and uh, we think we can learn from here and, <coughs> uh, and uh, Norway can, uh, yeah, you can learn from us. I th think something that we have in uh, the Nordic countries we call the Nordic model, which is a uh, trust-based uh, collaboration between both the business and the um, employees and the um, governments, where it's kind of what we call a social contract, where uh, we agree to collaborate towards um, finding solutions that are good for all parts. I think that's something that we can maybe share. <laughs> and what we call the mainstreaming of uh, impact investing, there is, um, I'd say, a hype in the way that now the big financial institutions are jumping in. And there's also potential and sometimes happening a corruption and kind of greenwashing or uh, marketing usage of the term, which is in a way negative, but I think also at the same time you spread the message and there's um, the fundamentals are absolutely there that uh, this is, I believe, one of the best ways to solve social problems. In addition to what I see in the business, tech businesses I work in, there is a definite shift towards thinking as a business you need to provide value to somebody. You have to focus on the value you create for somebody instead of like, extracting value from the customer. And I think that's um, a definite shift that's happening and I think in addition to that, uh, the need for businesses to attract the smartest heads and the smartest heads in the middle generation does not want to work just for money, they want purpose. So I think there's definitely fundamentals that's very good.